Here's a simple little story. Two weeks ago, just before I closed, I was about to close, and my wife said to me, you know, here's a little unfinished business. A friend of ours owes you some money. You've never asked him for it. You've never written. You've never mentioned it to anyone, but he owes you the money. You're closing up for the entire summer. You will not be here until late fall. I don't think it's fair to him, fair to you, fair to me, that he continues indefinitely without ever mentioning the fact that he owes you the money. I said, all right, you want the money? He said, yes. I said, all right, I will do it in my own way. I will not ask him for it. I will not write him for it. I will not phone him for it. But I will do it in my own way of imagination. So I imagined, first of all, he had the money. You can't get it from someone who has the money. So I first of all assumed he had it. And then I went beyond that. You can have money and be unwilling to pay less, you know. You may have millions and owe the grocery store and still won't pay it. So I first of all saw him with money, lots of money. And then I saw him willing and eager to pay me. And then I received from him whatever he owed me. This I did on Wednesday. On Friday, the phone rang about 4.30. He was my friend. He hasn't called me in over a year. He said, are you busy tonight? I said, yes, I'm lecturing tonight. He said, that's right, it's Friday night. Well, my wife and I will come to the meeting tonight. It's perfectly all right. So he came to the meeting. After the meeting, he said, you ride home with me. And Bill, who's my wife, she'll go home with the one who brought you. And my wife will go with you, with her. So we went over to the parking lot. And he always drove an old jalopy. Something falling apart. But I saw nothing like that in the lot. And he took me over towards this wonderful Chrysler the New Yorker model, with everything in it that money could buy. But he drove me home. A new car was under a thousand miles. Not a word was said on the way home about money. Not a word was said at home. The one who drove my wife and his wife home left about quarter of eleven. And then five minutes later, she opened her purse and said, Neville, this is long, long overdue, but I think you'll find it in order, and handed me a check for $1,200. I never asked for it. Never once in the five years he's owed it to me did I ever breathe it. And he gave me, she gave me $1,200. This is how it works. If you believe in the reality of your own wonderful imaginal acts, it came out of the nowhere, and now he has money. Things rolled in for him. He's completely out of debt and free of that feeling of owing friends money over so many, many years. So, try it, and then share with me the results of your experiment. And now, I think I'm going to ask my friends, the ushers, to pass among you. Should we take every dream seriously or only certain ones, and how do we distinguish the difference? Did you hear the question? Should we take every dream seriously or only a few, and how will we distinguish the difference between the significant dream and just an ordinary dream. Well, first of all, every dream is a communication from God. Every dream has meaning, but we are past masters at misinterpreting the dream. Quite often we need the help of someone who understands the universal language of symbolism. And there is a universal language of symbolism. But if, for instance, I had a dream concerning a pig, it doesn't mean I'm going to have roast pork for dinner. 
A pig is a universal symbol of the Redeemer of the universe. And the Redeemer and the Creator are one. So follow the reasoning behind the pig. What was it in the story of the pig? I had that dream. Here was this little pig in an enormous interior where they were displaying flowers and plants, all kinds of vegetation. And just closing time, I noticed there's a little pig, a little runt. And so seeing no one around, I picked him up and placed him on something what, as tall as this. And then I took some flowers, and I took some uh, green leaves and made a bait for him. And I also knew that it may not be the best food for him, but he could survive on flowers and leaves until someone opened the place the next day. And then as happens in dreams, it just quickly shifted. And now I'm on the inside of an enormous supermarket. And looking down, here's the pig. And the pig is a tall, thin, rangy fellow, quite thin. But I found him, he was a tiny runt. And then I looked at him, I knew he was the same pig. And I said to my daughter, Vicky, I said, Vicky, get me some crackers for the pig. And she said, I haven't any money, Daddy. I said, all this belongs to us. Ask no favors, go and take it. Take some crackers. And meanwhile, I started needing something to feed him. And my brother Victor came by and he said, what are you doing? I'm getting some food for my pig. And then he added some very thick-looking gravy, three heaping uh, handfuls. I thanked him and I started to complete this kneading. And then my daughter went over to a huge pyramid of crackers and she pulled one from the base, which unbalanced the entire picture and they all fell. As they fell, it revealed a little candle, about four inches tall, and the candle was lit. And I said to her, that's my candle. Then the words from scripture came into my mind. The words of Job and the words of Proverbs. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And when his candle shines upon my forehead, by its light I walk through darkness. So I say to Vicky, do not put the crackers back, that's lit now. It must never be hid again. Never be put under a bed, under a bushel, under anything. Now that that light is lit, it must remain lit. And then I woke. Well, here is the fake, the universal symbol of the Redeemer. When I have found that imagining creates reality, and told it, it isn't a day in my life I don't have opportunities to exercise it. The thinness of the pig revealed to me I had not been as faithful to the feeding of Christ as I should have been. He symbolized Christ. And I knew how to feed him by exercising my imagination lovingly on behalf of others. When I saw the opportunity to help and did it, exercise my imagination loving on behalf of the other who needed help, I didn't feed him. I am feeding Christ every time I exercise my imagination in a loving manner. So that's the interpretation of that thing. If I didn't know the language of symbolism, I would have wondered, what am I dreaming about a pig? And the whole thing would have seemed so stupid. Yet that was communicating to me my lack of exercising what I knew. Not everyone knows imagining creates reality, so you can't judge them. But if you know it, and you don't exercise it, you are not feeding Christ.